This week on Monero Talk is sponsored by Cake Wallet. Store, send, receive, and exchange your Monero safely on your iOS and Android too. Cake Wallet is open source and you always control your own keys and seed. And by XMR.to. Anonymously exchange your Monero into Bitcoin and seamlessly send Monero to any Bitcoin address. Go to XMR.to or use it right in your Cake Wallet. Cake Wallet and XMR.to are trusted and verified by the Monero community. Monero Talk is also made possible from contributions by viewers and listeners like you. This week on Monero Talk. Douglas Tuman interviews Mitchell Krawick Thayer and Adam Corbo, who have put forth the proposal to research post quantum strategies for Monero. This study aims to put the Monero project at the forefront of being a cryptocurrency ready for dealing with the inevitable evolution of quantum computers. Douglas, Mitchell, and Adam discuss the purpose and features of the proposal, including how the Monero project may prepare itself to prevent potential quantum computing attacks on the vulnerabilities of Monero. Monero Talk starts now. All right. What's going on, guys? It's, uh, it's going. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So wait, where are you guys located right now? I'm in uh, the Bay Area. Uh, and I think, yeah, Mitchell. I'm just north of Denver currently. Nice. How's, how's, the, how's the lockdown treating you guys? Pretty good. I've just been in the same house for three months straight. <laughs> but not too bad. How about you? Uh, it's, it's all right. I mean, you know, try, we're trying to do a lot with the, the running for Congress and, you know, not being able to, to go outside and knock on doors has made it. Oh, difficult. canvassing and campaigning have to be Yeah, it doesn't go well together. Oh, boy. But no, we've, we've been doing well. We've been doing well. But it's, uh, right. it's I, feel like, I feel like a lot of people are feeling a lot of stresses these days, you know, the being locked in, locked down. Yeah, so, it's usual time. So uh, I guess we'll, we'll talk about the, uh, what is the title? The Identifying Practical Post-Quantum Strategies for Monero. So very exciting, very exciting topic. How did uh, how did this come about? How did you guys decide to work on this? Um, you, you, I'll let Mitchell start off. Yeah, so I've been looking at years for how do we do very long-term privacy for Monero. Um, and so that includes building not just against today's adversaries, but tomorrow's, which I've been looking at. You know, what are statistical methods that could be used in the future? What are different brute force methods that could be used in the future? And then when we started looking at, well, what if we use uh, quantum algorithms? Things started to get scary. Um, and it was clear that pieces of it would break, but it wasn't quite clear which pieces would break. And so at this point, you know, if it's something we're going to be using, I definitely want to know uh, how it's going to fare, you know, kind of what our options are and then what to expect as, uh, you know, as times change. And so... Uh, this is kind of an open thread that I had been looking into. And then Adam came along and as kind of the expert matter on the quantum side of things, um, it was just, it seemed like a great opportunity to really kind of dive in and answer a lot of these questions that had been open definitive uh, kind of like research and answers to them. Very cool. Yeah. I mean, the, kind of the standard response to to any of this when it's brought up is always, well, you know, that's quantum computing. It's so far off. It's, you know, it's probably never going to happen. Or if it does, it's not going to be like what we expect. Um, so what's kind of your guys' response to that? I mean, because is that narrative not now changing? Is it becoming more real than what we've ex kind of been expecting? Um, I'll jump in and then I'll kind of hand over to Adam. The what main thing that I kind of keep in mind is that the risk profile changes when you're considering security versus privacy. Uh, when it comes to security features that can break, uh, there's plenty of time to fix that, right? Or there presumably is plenty of time to fix that. Because all you have to do is make sure that you've got stuff locked down uh, before these computers start looking at Monero. Now, with privacy, it's a completely different matter because if a, trend, uh, you know, if a quantum algorithm can be used to either uh, deobfuscate the transaction graph, in which case you're kind of throwing out ring signatures and actually seeing the true flow of funds uh, or demask transaction amounts, that kind of thing. Uh, then the time frame becomes much more urgent, right? So 
any transaction that I make today is going to be forever immortalized on the Monero blockchain. And that includes any vulnerabilities to that, right? So if 20, 30 years from now, we start saying, oh, well, we need to upgrade our security features, it's already too late on the privacy side. Like I can't take back the, the information that I published. And so that's where we kind of have uh, the you know fire under our rear, so to speak, where um, that retroactive denonymization is going to be uh, permanent if and when it occurs. And so that's why we're kind of like looking at it right now. In my, from my perspective, it doesn't matter whether uh, practical quantum computers were to become an issue uh, two years from now, five years from now, or 40 years from now, I still plan to be alive in 40 years, and I would like my transaction history to remain private. Um, and so that's kind of uh, where I started coming at it. Adam, I don't know if you want to. Uh, well, it's it's not a it's it's a question of when, not if, and whether someone has already developed a quantum computer capable of like you know of deploying Shor's algorithm effectively or any other sort of like effective scheme. Uh, I mean, when it happens, I don't even know if like it will be in the mainstream consciousness in the sense of, I mean, it only real, like we live in a world built on locks, the structures, everything's built on locks and privacy and everything in the information era. And I mean, there ha the only thing I can really think of that's like equivalent to something like this in terms of like a MacGuffin is kind of like uh, the Manhattan Project of World War II in the sense of like suddenly there's just this like, this is the, the Manhattan Project of the information era kind of in a sense, a little bit. I, I like to make that as a historical analogy, but it, it, it when it happens, like it's, it's, it's going to happen and someone's going to have it. And we don't know who's going to have it. And do you really want your privacy, you know, attacked right in that moment? But I don't know. I mean, it's, it's a, it's, it's quite a MacGuffin, I suppose, but it, it, it I think as, as I, I, I was, uh, I studied physics and astrophysics at UC Berkeley. And I, I remember being in a lot of like the labs and talking with people and it's, I think, a lot amongst the physics community, there's not, of course, a, a general consensus whether it's, like, going to happen or not. I, I mean, of course, there's still, like, of course, with any field of science, there's always going to be skeptics and such. But it's it's pretty, the general consensus is that it, it's definitely practical and that it can happen. I mean, it, it was first formulated by Feynman in 19, the 1980s as, like, a billiard ball computer analogy. And instead of billiard balls, you use, you know, quantum systems and uh, you, doing computational uh things and eventually you get you know much greater exponential speed ups but yeah it's 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 a when not an if hmm. and so but is the idea that we'll be able to protect transactions made up until a certain point I mean, are we ever going to be able to protect the, the transactions that have already happened um is that is that the idea or we're we realizing like those will eventually be unraveled that's yeah that's the stressful piece exactly is that we can't do anything about transactions that exist so if it takes us say it takes us three or four years to get uh post-quantum privacy features in monero then every transaction between now and 2024 will be later de-anonymized so that's where that's where there's a difference between for security features you have that like long window but for privacy features it's literally what we publish today is around forever and so that's where we want to move those in as early as possible. And is there, there's never any way around that, right? That's, a, that's just a problem that can't be solved. One of the downsides to an immutable ledger is that it's immutable. <laughs> <laughs> but actually, there's a downside in this case. So what, what is the scope of the proposal? What are, we, uh, what, are, what are you guys actually trying to achieve with the proposal? You want to step through or shall I? Uh, I can I can start off and then you can finish. Uh, but as far as like my original, we we were both working on the proposal, talking back with each other. It, it actually this really all arose from like the project I did at Insight last um, before you know the whole coronavirus craziness, uh, and uh, the the it involved basically just like probing vulnerabilities in current like cryptocurrencies and other things to you know quantum computers, and then. From that, it eventually, I mean, my, my initial proposal talking with him, we were talking back and forth, was uh, like basically seeing how Monero could be vulnerable to, uh, you know, potential quantum attacks. And then after that, seeing, uh, you know, how we could plug the holes potentially using either lattice cryptography or some other uh, method that's currently being developed right now um, and seeing how, how it really would affect how, how we could implement that, how it affects the network and everything else. Um, 
yeah, you, you can jump on the rest, Mitchell. Yeah. Um, so there's kind of, I'll say there's a couple phases to it. So the first one is a very thorough audit. And what we're going to do is very carefully define uh, features of interest. So uh, how does transaction amount masking? How about sender uh, privacy? How about recipient privacy? All of that. So we'll list all the features that we're interested in. And then we'll list all of the algorithms that could potentially be used against this. Um, and I guess it's a good point to make an interjection that even though quantum computers uh, that can operate at large scales may be a couple years off, these algorithms have been known for decades, right? Shor's algorithm was, was that in the 90s? Um, yeah, yeah. So we know, we already know there's Shor's algorithm, which can be used for factoring. There's Grover's algorithm, which can be used to kind of get inputs for a black box. There's Fourier phishing. And so we're going to make a big grid of here's all the pieces that can break. Here's all the ways to break them. And then we'll literally go square by square and identify exactly which pieces uh, are susceptible. And that, the nice thing is we'll also know then which pieces are plausibly secure. Um, now, I have to put an asterisk, right, that there could always end up being some algorithm that hasn't been discovered yet. But based on the large body of knowledge that exists, we can perform this kind of analysis. And then we'll do a, like a very thorough write-up where we're kind of say like, you know, this piece of Monero could be vulnerable to this type of attack by an adversary that can use this algorithm. Uh, to fix it, solutions need to take into account this, uh, and you know we'll be able to implement that when devices get to this part. So it's kind of like very clearly lay out um, a roadmap to what needs to be fixed, what doesn't, all of that. And then we'll kind of dive into the existing literature, because uh, again, not only have the algorithms that quantum computers could use be known, uh, lattice cryptography, uh, iso uh, what is it, isogeny-based cryptography, there's all kinds of crypto systems out there that are designed to be post-quantum secure. Um, so that's the cool part, is we can actually now start playing like uh, mix and match with here's the list of problems that we need to deal with, and then here's plausible crypto systems that could potentially solve those. Um, and so that's kind of where we'll be, where we'll be diving, is leaving guidelines uh, for future researchers and everything about like, here are the things we need to keep in mind as we're developing Monero. Mm -hmm. So do you, do you think we ever get there to the point where Monero becomes quantum secure? Oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, I mean, it's definitely possible. So the... Yeah, actually, I think I can go ahead and say that. Yeah, I feel like the, I was like, I, I don't, I'm always afraid to make bold claims before we do the research, right? Like that's that's not good science. That's a good practice. Uh, <laughs> um, but based on the large body of existing tools out there, uh, it seems like the pieces should exist to match. The tricky part is that there's always trade-offs, right? And it's privacy efficiency trade-offs. Uh, the keys that are produced by these, like a lot of these systems require much larger keys, uh, require longer verification time, longer proof time. And so the tricky part is that some of what we come up with, you know, in the next couple of months, may be a little bit too large to implement, you know, by the end of the year or something. If it has, you know, four megabyte keys, that's going to be a little bit excessive um, and like hard to handle. But the good news is if you look at the, wait, is this showing up as my left or my right hand? You're, well, you're right. Oh, it's just showing up on my on your right. Okay, so I'll work this way. Uh, is that over time the like proof sizes decrease? Right, we find more efficient proving systems. We find more efficient ways to handle them, uh, and device capabilities increase. Right, like your cell phone is now more powerful than your computer was ten years ago. And so the notion is, you know, there may be like a little gap of like, okay, so we find here's the type of systems you would need to use. It's a little bit too bulky for today's phones, today's internet. Uh, but we want to have those guideposts to work towards so that as we go over the next couple of years, it's then clear like what we need to implement. So in terms of can we make Monero post-quantum secure, uh, or post-quantum secure, post-quantum private, the answer is definitely like, yes, we can. The technology should exist. Uh, and it's just a question of like, what do we need to do to get there and to implement it? Mm. Adam, you have any comments on that? Uh I actually just wanted to add one more thing on the, when you were talking about like what, like we're making a grid of like, uh, there's stuff that, you know, things we know, things we don't know, things we don't know, we don't know, you know, uh, we don't know what, what algorithms could be invented in the future for quantum computers to attack um, anything. But I think, I mean, the, the only thing really quantum computers really do is change the complexity class of problems that it can solve in polynomial time faster than a classical computer. And so we're thinking that the bounds of that is bigger 
then, you know, it depends on if you believe if P equals NP or whatever, but um, uh, it, it, it's... The, the problems it, it solves better than a classical are are always just going to be uh, you know problems that usually are more intractable intractable classically that you can just solve you know do more computations faster essentially so we can even 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 the the things we know that um, you know even we can still even say like oh this is possibly could be vulnerable in the future as well so. But yeah, eventually you, you show all the possible leaks, you know, that could ever possibly exist. I mean, it, it's possible to do that, I think, even without knowing, you know, the full range of what you can do with this sort of new technology. And um, yeah, I mean, this is different from Moore's Law in the sense that period doubling of like how many transistors you can fit on a chip. I mean, to use, to coin a phrase, kind of, or like, you know, uh, it, it's a quantum leap in computing technology and just being able to do more computations per second. That's why it kind of like, it disrupts a lot of security features in a lot of different um, applications and such uh, that could exist when, when it comes out, you know, when it, when it is yeah. you know, impractical. Uh, yeah. So as far as like the claim, can we make Monero quantum proof? Uh, I, I, I mean, yeah, I'd have to say that I, I, it's a, a matter of like finding the correct methods and then being able to apply them efficiently. Maybe I could add on to that just as an, a, the short addendum, yes, that is, I, I could say that's a true statement, but maybe uh, would a Monero be efficient still? <laughs> no, I don't know. I don't know. That's why we're doing this. <laughs> yeah, that's what we want to answer. Yeah. Do you potentially see it as maybe being, you know, a, a fork of, of Monero that, you know, becomes a new, a new coin of its own? Like, is that a potential scenario? Because some of the community not willing to sacrifice efficiencies and other parts I of the think, community wanting this more Monero gold type feature. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I would consider that a last resort. Um, and one of the main reasons for that is if you do a fork of the Monero blockchain, uh, which several have happened in the last couple of years, where people can claim the same outputs, there's actually an issue called key image reuse. And so if I were to fork the blockchain, and then every time someone tries to spend on one chain or the other, they would leak that key image. Just, 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 um, there's a whole lot of privacy issues that arise with that. Um, and I think another thing to kind of consider is that this isn't uh, like an all or nothing, an all or nothing kind of case, right? So there are going to be some potential improvements that you know may double or triple the transaction size in the name of privacy. And there will be conversations about whether the community does or doesn't want that. There also may be some very low hanging fruit uh, so, for example, uh, with Grover's algorithm, we speculate that someone could potentially forge a block that has the same hash but different data in it. Now, if we want to fix that or prevent that, all we would have to do is grab a post-quantum hash function, of which many exist, and just add it every you know six months when we check mark check uh, the blockchain and whatnot. So that's something where we could like add post quantum immutability, and it would literally add you know a couple bytes every six months and be instant to verify. So there's each individual feature that we're looking at hardening will have its own uh, you know kind of sets of trade offs and whatnot. Um, and I think they'll probably be implemented piecewise. Hmm. Now, ha have any other uh, projects made pro progress on this? Any other coins that we know of? Is anybody making breakthroughs in this area? There have been a couple papers on um, post-quantum crypto cash that are theoretical. And then the main one that jumps out now is there is a quantum resistant ledger. Uh, that's the name of it, quantum resistant ledger. And they have focused on blockchain immutability. So there's the privacy piece and the security piece. They've really been nailing down the security. Um, and so actually an interesting thing is they have immutability based uh, on post-quantum security, so the hashes. And then they're also looking at adopting random X as the proof of work uh, function, which is pretty cool. I've had some phone calls with them. They're doing really great work. They, at the moment, do not have any privacy features. So, uh, you know, transaction amounts are visible, sender, receiver, all of it. Um, however, they have been, like, looking into some experimental privacy features. Um, so I'm, like, looking forward to collaborations with them. I definitely plan to read everything they've written and understand like what are the best practices and which of those could apply to Monero because we don't want to reinvent the wheel anywhere else. Someone has like very nicely published a white paper on it. Mm -hmm. Those are the ones that come to mind uh, currently. 
I believe, don't quote me on this, I believe that the Halo proving system proposed for Zcash is plausibly post-quantum. Uh, I'm not sure if that's been proven, and I'm not sure how far out implementation is. Yeah, about Zcash in general, I mean, how, how, would, how are they currently affected uh, by a, you know, a, a quantum future? If, if they were to, to stay as is, how would they be affected? You know, if we, uh, do we, do we know? I mean, I know you guys are looking at, at Monero, but um, what would the effect be on something like a Zcash if we had, you know, quantum computers in, in five years versus the effects on Monero? I will, okay, I'm going to put a big asterisk that's <laughs> like possible for me to speculate on this. Um, I think that right now we're in the same boat, basically. Um, I don't think Monero or Zcash has a particular edge in this case. Then I suspect that they are probably also susceptible to some of the issues where anytime you can break security based on the discrete log problem, which Shor's algorithm can do, that starts letting you do kind of weird stuff like deriving private keys from public keys, which we definitely don't want to do. Um, and so I think I think they're going to be in the same boat, uh, but I won't speculate any further because I really haven't looked at it in that context. Hmm. Okay. And do we know if like the Bitcoin project is working on anything? To you mentioned that other that other coin. That's that sounds like what they're trying to do, kind of make a more secure version of something like a Bitcoin that has a transparent ledger do you know if bitcoin itself the bitcoin project is is concerned or working on anything like this have you guys come across that at all not to my knowledge but i could very easily be overlooking something um they are also going to have the same problems where uh public keys can be used to generate private keys, that kind of stuff. So they're also definitely in the same boat security. They don't have the same privacy considerations. Um, I don't know how much it's being working on. I know that in every ecosystem, definitely including Monero, there's people that weigh in at different points for what privacy and efficiency trade-offs they're willing to make, right? I'm actually at one very extreme end where I'm like, yes, make the privacy trade-offs. I don't care if it's like a four kilobyte transaction. I just want it to remain private. Um, but th that's different. Pe different people have different views and different use cases and all of that. I think Bitcoin tends to be very far. The majority of people tend to be very far towards the efficiency side. Um, and I don't like to generalize, but I think as a broad statement, uh, the Bitcoin community is very thoughtful about anything that's going to impact performance. And that would probably slow adoption of anything of this nature. Adam, how, how are you approaching this? Are you approaching this as, are you a Monero guy who's who's now, you, who also happens to be, you know, an expert in this rare field of, of uh, quantum computers? Or are you a quantum computer guy that's now just looking at the Monero project because you, you find that kind of an interesting thing to look at? Um, I'd say I'm kind of, I, like, definitely my background is in, in physics um, from Berkeley. But I, I did, when I was at Berkeley, I also did a, a class or two on blockchain technology. Um, they weren't very good classes. But <laughs> so I, I, I've, I've known about Monero for a little bit. But I mean, I guess I really got intimately, like, under, started understanding it during, like, the Insight Internship um, class okay. or beginning this year. And that... Yeah, that definitely. I, I I'd say I'm definitely looking at this as like a. I mean, to be honest, like doing this 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 research and uh, understanding the vulnerabilities and how you could correct them potentially, you could easily apply this to other cryptocurrencies. And in some cases, it kind of could end up being like a gold standard to some degree. So it is an interesting project. It is an interesting like uh, you know both mathematically and also just like in general. Uh, so yeah, I mean, I I still I still think it's uh, interesting. Interesting project. <laughs> Definitely. Now, what resources are you guys going to be using? I mean, this seems like such a, such a, you know, a, a hard thing to tackle here. Is it, Adam? Are you, is it really just going to be you, kind of like buckling down, trying to figure this stuff out? Or are you are you using other resources and, and other people as well? How does this? <laughs> MRL is helping out. <laughs> What's that? Monero Research Lab uh, has been very helpful with a lot of the early advice, putting this together and framing. Okay. Okay. 
Yeah, I also, I mean, I, I guess I, I don't know if I mentioned this to Mitchell actually, but I, I have a couple of uh, friends at Berkeley that I went to, that I went to undergrad with who are also kind of a little bit interested in the problem too. So I've been talking with them a little bit too about it and they, they've been interested uh, in some of it. I mean, yeah, there's definitely, oh, with uh, implementing, I mean, also as far as resources, I've been kind of building my own um, like node server in which I could basically just test implementing different um, ways to use Monero technology, changing cryptographic schemes, and cryptographic primitives and stuff. But um, yeah, so a lot of it's going to be homebrewed, uh, homebrewed. And then of course, yeah, utilizing other resources such as what Mitchell talked about and mm -hmm. so our own yeah. uh, friends and such. <laughs> yeah, and Zero to Monero is great for the auditing side. And then there is a huge body of literature for the solution side. If you actually, if you look at the proposal, we have an appendix a mile long of like, different resources that we'll be evaluating as solutions. Uh, shout out to Brandon, AKA Saray, who put that list together. Very cool. And um, I see the timeline's pretty, actually pretty aggressive. You guys are expecting to have something to show in like a few months. Yeah, we'll be going at this full time. So hoping to make some good steam through it. Yeah. Are you guys hearing any big criticisms yet or anything or like what's kind of the response you're getting from from the community or people outside of the Monero community um what kind of feedback are you guys getting is it just all thumbs up let's look into look into this or is there are there people kind of like skeptical of the of the endeavor what kind of responses are you guys seeing the broadly the uh feedback has been positive people want a long-term private Monero uh, the uh, initially, actually, we had, in a different version of the proposal, we were going to be doing a bunch of, like, putting together code prototypes and whatnot, and then received helpful feedback that actually roadmap information would be, like, more useful in understanding broad trade-offs and whatnot. Um, naturally, there's always people that kind of cringe when you mention that the transaction size might increase in the future. Um, but, you know, at this point, you know, we're just doing the research. We're not shoving uh, new code down anyone's throats. So people will then be able to have the information that they need to make those informed trade-offs. Very cool. So, I mean, from a practicality standpoint, how do you, how do you guys treat Monero? So like knowing everything you guys know, right? Because I mean, you kind of, you guys see it at, at, at a deeper level here. You see this quantum computing being inevitable and eventually things being potentially being unraveled. So do you, do you take that into account when you're using Monero? Is that, is it affecting your kind of the way you currently interact with Monero today? This may be an unpopular opinion. I think that all cryptocurrencies, including Monero are very much at the alpha stage. Um, and so <laughs> I would I wouldn't, I was actually, so when I was editing uh, Mastering Monero, I was actually very adamant about adding a line that's like, if something is a matter of life and death, don't use brand new experimental cryptography. Like, um, you know, so I, so yeah, I, I just, I treat, I take everything with a grain of salt. All of them, um, I guess, I, I don't know. It might bump people out if I say that like I'm not really a heavy cryptocurrency user, um, but I definitely see this as like a very early stage technology that's under heavy development. Okay. I mean, I think it's good. It's healthy to have you know somebody like yourself who maybe is a little less biased, and you're really just taking like a mathematical scientific approach to this. Uh, mm -hmm. and, and I think I think that's always been a great thing about the Monero community is it, it attracts that that type of person to it. Uh, Lots Adam, of skeptics. I, I really like that when I joined. Yeah, I think, I think that's very tons of internal have. skeptics. Yeah. Um, Adam, do you kind of, are you viewing things the same way? Uh, yeah, for the, for the most part. I mean, like I, I'm, I'm basically the way I'm approaching this project is, I mean, and like you said, there's three phases of it. Um, first is just like seeing what 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 are the problems, you know, really actually looking at it, doing a deep dive, um, and I mean. Maybe somebody's already done this in like a quick five hour search, but we're really going to like spend a week on this at least and like really dig down and what's what what are possible vulnerabilities. And then, I mean, after that, it's basically just uh, really after that is basically buckling down and seeing like what can we build to, you know, plug up these holes and ha and seeing how it could be implemented and how it, it affects the network if we did implement this and 
Doing that in three months is like, I think definitely probably during the last month is probably going to get really like hectic. Um, but I think that during the first two months, it's probably mostly just going to be like, you know, understanding different ways to build it. And then just the actual building part, of building, you know, live code demos of just like, okay, here's all the nodes. And instead of using, you know, current cryptographic primitives, utilizing RSA or using like lattice cryptography, how does it affect it? And then you just publish the results. And that's just what it is, you know? And it, the thing is, is there's more, there's more ways, uh, there's most po po more post-quantum cryptography methods than lattice cryptography um, that exist currently. And uh, it could be interesting research and seeing like how, what, what comes out of that. So, yeah. Hmm. Now, you guys were saying initially, um, so something like Monero is, is more susceptible to, to this quantum computing issue than something like Bitcoin? because Monero is trying to be private in addition to being secure. Um, do you want to elaborate on that a little bit more? Like, so, so, I mean, there's, we always talk about this perfectly binding versus being perfectly blinding and, you know, how Monero kind of made that sacrifice um, mm -hmm. so, so that it could have its privacy, but it's, it's not perfectly uh, binding as opposed to something like Bitcoin that chose the opposite route. Do you guys uh, agree with that assessment of, of trade-offs, or is is does Bitcoin have its own vulnerabilities to quantum computers? Is is Monero more vulnerable to to quantum? Uh, oh computer? yeah, uh, yeah. I can elaborate. So if you look at the security vulnerabilities, which is like I can, as a quantum computer, find your private key and steal your funds. That applies to you know Bitcoin, Monero, anything using elliptic curve cryptography or the discrete log problems. This is just like across the board, everyone has these same security issues. Uh, then on the other side, you have these privacy issues of like, hey, this was an encrypted amount. Just kidding, I can tell it's 12 Monero. Uh, those Bitcoin is not susceptible because it doesn't have those privacy features. So it's literally just things that we have that Bitcoin doesn't that are potentially vulnerable. Um, it's not like Bitcoin is secured against it. They just don't have that privacy attack but service is, in the first place. Is, so, but is, is the argument that some are making like, uh, you know, if, if we get to the point where quantum computers exist and can do these things, is it that, you know, Bitcoin might be OK because they would just choose to attack Monero first or something? Is it like I don't or are they both equally susceptible to to breakthroughs in quantum computing that will disrupt uh the core technology of crypto, you know, the cryptography behind cryptocurrency. I would, I would say equally susceptible. Um, and which, which one you go after first really depends on whether your goal is surveillance or if your goal is theft or if your goal is forgery, like, uh, that's going to largely drive that decision. Um, and then in terms of the like blinding versus binding thing, um, which I think kind of boils down to, do we guarantee that it's the right amount or guarantee that it's impossible for an outsider to figure out what it is, to kind of, kind of like boil it down? I don't have strong, like philosophical, I know some people have strong philosophical opinions about it. I don't, I like, I like the blinding. I think it's, anyway, I think it's good from a privacy standpoint. The, it does potentially, and when I say potentially, I mean like we don't know, we'll know in a month, uh, it does potentially open up avenues for uh, forgery. And so that's one of those things we want to very quickly check, look into. And then if it is possible to misreport an output amount when you spend it without tricking the, or without tricking the cryptographic safeguards, uh, then we would want to kind of quickly, very quickly move towards a post-quantum output. Um, but I don't know if that's going to be an issue. Hmm. Adam, you have any uh, comment on that? Um, about like comparing uh, vulnerability of Bitcoin to Monero for quantum computing. Um, I mean, uh, it, just a very top top off of my head. Um, I mean, Bitcoin relies on public and private key elliptic curve cryptography, um, and I mean, using Shor's algorithm, you could easily find the private key of a transaction and basically find you know forge that and take every someone's bitcoins you know that's it's a very basic attack i mean that that would require much more like um many more qubits to utilize shore's algorithm effectively to do that 
Um, but I mean, also something I was looking at at my time at Insight was, you know, other algorithms that would be much easier to implement that could be used to, for instance, forge a block in the uh, blockchain network. But that that still would be pretty hard. But it's still uh, still worth thinking about. Because you implemented the proof of concept on a five qubit real quantum computer, right? Yeah, yeah. You, you, there's, there's actually, a, 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 I don't know if this is a shameless plug, but uh, uh, there, through IBM, there is this thing called uh, the IBM Quantum Experience, where they have, uh, they have, you know, various. They have, I think it's like two to sixteen qubits, and then like they're working on like a thirty-two qubit um, quantum computer. Um, network where basically you can write your own code in Python, and uh, they have a library called Qskit. And you can basically implement uh, actual quantum algorithms on these uh, on this hardware that's located all over the world, um, and you can actually put in your code and actually run it on an actual quantum computer and get an output, which is usually you know like a, a, a measurement of qubits, um, and you can basically use that information to you know make decisions and such. So um, d during my time, I actually implemented something called Grover's algorithm on. Uh, the IBM QX2 uh, hardware, and I basically demoed a proof of concept where if you have Bitcoin, basic, basically Bitcoin, except instead of you know having an SHA-256 hash algorithm, it's like a you know a four-bit hash algorithm because I was only using four qubits. Um, you can theoretically you know prove that you could find the nonce of a ledger uh, quadratically faster than you know same operation done on a classical computer. Um, but, and it, it could be faster than that, technically, um, but that's all theoretical, I guess. But th th the proof of concept was like, yeah, you can do this right now with current technology for a very small uh, amount of qubits. But uh, scaling up, yeah, it, it could present a vulnerability, especially if you have like quantum miners running and it, it just like you're, you're ch churning out blocks every nanosecond. So <laughs> you're mining blocks every nanosecond, yeah. If, if it really did work that way. But I mean, there's obviously other hardware limitations I didn't go over, such as like how, how fast like current like technology using superconducting qubits and microwaves is there's a current time limitation with that as well and other things but yeah <laughs> it, it's it's definitely possible to do that and you can just mess with that uh, yourself if you want to on that website it's it's pretty fun <laughs> very cool so adam where, where are we currently at with quantum can you can you kind of give us a good understanding of where we currently are at with quantum computing um well it, for my time at berkeley uh I, People were, I mean, they're using superconducting qubit models. And um, I mean, stuff that we know about, it's like, I don't know. I, I think there was recently something published by Google where they had like a 52 or 57 qubit. I don't exactly remember the exact number of qubits, but I know it was over 50. And they recently re supposedly reached a milestone where they, uh, they, they basically demonstrably, demonstrably proved that they did a computation on a quantum computer that would have been basically impossible to do on a classical computer. Like quantum supremacy is the term as far as like, yeah, so publicly accessible quantum computers that we know about, it's like, I think we've basically reached the point where we're, we're about to go a little bit over or we're crossing the, the line of like, oh, okay, quantum computers are actually becoming more powerful than classical computers. And uh, weirdly enough, I was just reading this thing today. It was like uh, talking about Moore's Law. And it's like Moore's Law should taper out around the year 2020. And I was like just reading that right now. I was like, wow, that's perfect timing for quantum computers. <laughs> 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 Or it's, like, it's not exactly the same thing as like the next big thing, you know, for Moore's Law, like, oh, now we're going to do quantum computers now uh, in, in terms of hardware. But I mean, it, it is it is true that, uh, that that they're definitely they're definitely they're, they're definitely starting, at least from what we know, it's it's definitely it, it's starting to be taken like seriously. That Oh, yeah, these are definitely more powerful. Than, and another cool thing about quantum computers, too, actually, the research I did, well, it wasn't research, but a project I worked on was. We actually use quantum computers to uh, do machine learning faster than any classical computer, which was pretty cool using CERC, but um, which is another uh, library. <laughs> but it's for, for it's for the Google quantum computers, I guess. But um, mm. yeah, using tech libraries. Yeah. <laughs> so where are we? To really answer your question, where are we? Uh, we're 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 just at the the starting point. <laughs> And so, you know, Moore's law is used to kind of estimate, you know, uh, progress with traditional computers. Is there some, is there a, 
something that's used to estimate the progress of, of quantum computing and where you know Ooh, what pace question. at what pace <laughs> we're accelerating how many qubits per 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 decade yeah i mean the observation was made by my Moore, and he was like yeah it seems there's a, a, a doubling of the number of transistors you can fit on a ship and this was in the 60s and it held true even from like from the time of like uh turing in the 40s <laughs> and uh I think there might actually be a similar law for qubits, actually, weirdly enough, because it's 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 an interesting thing with qubits. It's kind of like there's something in, in quantum computing where it's like quantum error correction, where it's sort of like you want to actually check. Uh, and that's really important for being able to actually like make like real computations using a quantum computer. And it's kind of like the more qubits you have, the better like quantum error correction you can do with more qubits. <laughs> so it's, it's kind of like this kind of a weird like feedback process where it's just Basically, the power of quantum computing really just comes down to how many qubits you can manipulate, maintain, and do all sorts of things. And maybe some like really crazy breakthrough will happen like tomorrow or next year, or it's already happened. We don't know about it yet, you know. Like, um, but I think that there could be a point where it's just suddenly like you 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 have like room temperature um, quantum computers that like are actually really effective and. I mean, there's, there's little bits of there's little differences with with how it works, but yeah, I think it's basically a similar thing, like like period doubling, like every every year you basically get double the amount of like uh, qubits you can maintain. But I mean, that, that's as far as we know. Mm. Mm. Well, this is extremely exciting stuff, guy. Because I mean, I feel like you know uh, a year ago and whatever, even uh, a few months ago, whenever, like I said, whenever it was and it talked about and quantum computers were brought up or it was like, yeah, well, like, let's not even like worry about it. Right. I, I kind of felt like was kind of like the general like tone of how everybody would respond to that. But I think it's, it's really exciting to see that where you guys are, are investigating it. And, um, you know, it's like Adam said, it's, it's inevitable. Right. So, uh, it's a, super exciting to see that happening and that it's happening in the Monero community. So bravo to you guys. Uh, ex very excited for you guys. Have you guys raised uh, the money that you needed for this? Have you met your goal? Almost. Not quite. Not quite, but we're on the way. Um, there was a huge outpouring of support. The proposal hasn't – it's only been open for a day or two. Um, I think Rivar had to fix a little typo to get it live. And, uh, yeah, I think we're like more than two thirds of the way there. I mean, if anything, I see this kind of like, you know, the space program of, of crypto, right? So like, there's those that argue like, oh, is that really a useful, space program. useful wow. way to spend I your money? It. Like <laughs> there's other, you know, there's things that may come out of it that we don't even know. You're right. You know what I'm saying? It's like, you guys are really pushing the envelope in terms of, uh, research here. So, uh, that's actually a really good analogy. We're like right at the border of basic and applied research, right? We're pulling things from like the bleeding edge of theory. And then how can we put them into like the bleeding edge of private cryptocurrency? And it is so exciting to be able to do this for Monero. I think that probably we'll create tools and principles that end up being used by many ecosystems. Very cool. Is, is Howard uh, Chu involved at, at all? Uh, not at the moment. Okay. Just curious. Um, yeah, guys, I don't know. I, I think that's really all the questions I have. Is there, where can, you know, anybody that's watching, where could people learn more about this and learn more about you? Where should, uh, where should they go? Uh, the, so the proposal lays out a lot of like the background of how this could potentially impact Monero. Um, so that would, uh, that would, if you want something that specifically speaks to the implications for Monero, I would just check out the proposal. And then over the course of the research, we'll be making weekly updates in the Monero Research Lab meetings that happen every Wednesday. Uh, we'll do breaking Monero episodes as we move towards results. Uh, of course, we'll be putting stuff out on like Reddit and Twitter. I, I love to like tweet storm on research results. And then ultimately we'll be putting out the like, I think we are gonna put out guides at a couple levels. So one of them is gonna be the real high level, uh, kind of like Monero outreach version. It's just like a summary of where we're at, where we're going, all of that super, super lay. And then we will also do like very technical uh, write-ups for developers and researchers. So we're gonna kind of like spread this out. So it'll be a couple different places to tap into the research. Um, but yeah, I think, Otherwise, people are always welcome to, you know, contact me on IRC or if Smasek get Monero. Uh, 
yeah, I mean, if you, I guess on my end, uh, if, if you want to learn more about quantum computing, I highly recommend the book uh, Quantum Computing Since Democritus by Scott Aronson. <laughs> it's a really good book. It's also super entertaining. Uh, and I guess as far as, if, I mean, if you want to know more about me, I guess check out my LinkedIn. Uh, it's just Adam Corbin on LinkedIn. If you really just want to know more about that. Uh, but yeah, I, I, learning more about how... Um, QRL is also a good research on how on um, what people are doing for just like uh, applying post quantum cryptography. Oh, the QRL white paper is great. They really discuss different threat vectors and a survey of the field. So I would definitely actually check that out and recommend it. Yeah, yeah, uh, definitely, definitely that. Um, yeah, I don't know. I, I, yeah. <laughs> Right. We'll try to post these things in the show notes as well. This this book that you're mentioning, is this something that, you know, a regular Joe, Monero Joe can pick up and read? Or is this you need a, you know, a background in in certain uh, sciences or mathematics? There's um, I, I, I'd, I'd equate it to uh, what's the that, that Stephen Hawking book, A Brief History of Time. Yeah, that's okay. I, I equate it a little bit to that. There's there's some math in it for sure. Um, but it, it's it's very entertaining and he, he kind of. He goes at it from a, a very, I think, approachable angle. There's definitely some complicated parts, but it, it's very entertaining. And I think, um, I mean, you don't have to read the whole book, obviously, because there's like sections you can skip and stuff. But it, as far as just like understanding quantum computers, I think as far as like resources, that's the best one I know of just for a beginner. I'm going to check that out. Very cool. All right, guys. Thank you. Thanks for coming on. Do you guys want anything else you guys would like to bring up? <laughs> nothing comes to mind thanks so much for having us though yeah. do you want to do a, a follow-up show after we have results oh, of course. and kind of yeah. boil it down yeah, yeah let's do it yes definitely definitely of course all right guys good luck good luck on everything adam nice to meet you and nice to meet you and uh yeah we'd love to stay in touch and do a follow-up whenever you guys are ready do it thanks all right guys so long well. thank you thank you for joining us on this week's episode we release new episodes every week you can find and subscribe to the show on iTunes, Spotify, Stitcher, Google Play, YouTube, or wherever you listen to podcasts. And if you have an Alexa device, you can tell it to listen to the latest episode of the Monero Talk podcast. Go to monerotalk.live slash subscribe for a full list of places where you can watch and listen. If you want to interact with us, guests, or other podcast listeners, you can follow us on Twitter. And please leave us a review on iTunes. It helps people find the show, and we are always happy to read them. So thanks so much, and we look forward to being back next week.